this morning when I got up, God said, I I'm, I'm going to demonstrate to you, it's just you. I, I was laying on my sofa by Friday. Spirit of the Lord said, Sister Paula is putting together a trip to Branson. Why don't you bless somebody? Amen. And uh, I, I, uh, I said, that, well, I don't know who, who, who needs a blessing. I said, I really would like to do it. So I was willing. When I heard the voice, I obeyed. I said, I'm willing. So I said, maybe I'll just approach Sister Paula and say, Paula, do you know somebody that want to go on that trip? And I'll just pay that price for them. This morning when I got up and I was shaving, the Lord said, it's Paula. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I saw you. God showed me you. Amen. It could have gone to somebody else. But God said, no, it's Paula. Amen. He'll show you things. Yes. I said, well, why her, Lord? Because her gift in ministering to the saints Amen. at a time like this. Yes. Her gift. Faithful in her gift Amen. to minister to the saints. To put up with you sheep. <laughs> Faithful. Yes. Well, greetings from Grow to Go Christian Center. We welcome you to our broadcast today. And we're just praying that God has a special word for you today. And as we shared last week, you know, most of us need a word from the Lord. And our prayer is that you receive today a word from the Lord. God knows what your need is. I don't, but he does. And Holy Spirit knows what you have need of. And he's able to orchestrate things in a way that every one of you can receive what you have need of this day. This day. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And before I'm going to ask you to uh, turn in your Bibles, those of you who are listening by the Internet, to the book of John chapter 10. That's where we'll begin. But before we begin, we're going to hear uh, a song or two from our praise team and then we will return and begin our message. So get your Bibles, get your notebooks. I'll be giving you plenty of scriptures, um, Lord willing, today. But we'll begin in John 10 once we return. Amen. Amen.
Well, welcome back. My name is Minister Vernon Lewis, an elder here in the church, and uh, kind of a privilege to come before you today, uh, and uh, always kind of an honor uh, to minister to God's people. I always take it serious. Uh, in my teaching, I always have learned over the years to lean upon the Holy Spirit and direct me. Uh, so uh, I may stop and do some things that is unusual to you, but they're not unusual to God by any stretch of the imagination. The Bible says the sons of God are, are led by the what? Spirit. Spirit of God. I was riding over here in my car today and just being quiet because even in this message preparation, God has been teaching me some things and revealing some things to me. And... Um, one of the things the Lord was saying to me, one of the biggest challenges that you have in, the, in life, and perhaps more, more than fighting the devil, is your flesh. Amen. I think the Bible, if I'm correct, says more about the carnal nature of man than he talks about the devil. Because he knows he's already given us authority over the devil. 
But the problem we tend to encounter in life is the flesh. That's one of our biggest challenges. And that's, as my senior elder always say, and I hear this dusty flesh. <laughs> Praise you the Lord, Elder Johnson. Let's begin with John chapter 10. And we'll start in verse 1. And you can read along with me. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. Say this with me. The sheep, the sheep hear his voice. Hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Drop down to verse 14. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I am known by my own. Jump on over to verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. Say that with me. My sheep hear my voice. Say it again. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me. Oh, brother, you can just stop right there. That preach all by itself. David used an analogy, and really in God before even, even David, used an analogy about the, the people of God being like sheep. And in scripture, we see where he's considered to be the chief shepherd. shepherd. He didn't say we were like giraffes, or rhinos, or fish, or birds, or donkeys, or any other thing, but like sheep, why did he use that analogy? Because our personalities as believers is like that of sheep. When I was young, a little small town that my grandparents lived in, they had sheep and they raised sheep for two reasons, for their wool and also for eating. And I had a chance to be around sheep to a degree and they are very interesting creatures. It requires a certain kind of shepherd to raise healthy sheep. That shepherd has to be willing to lay down their life for those sheep because they're helpless creatures. And Jesus has said, I lay down my life for the sheep, which is you. He even goes so far to say, I have called out and given to the body of Christ gifts called pastors. Mm -hmm. Pastors should lay down their life for the sheep. Yes. Pastors know how to take care of the sheep. Pastors know each sheep by name. Go oh, glory. Oh, let me leave this alone. <laughs> He knows when the sheep is sick and need a little doctrine on Elder Johnson. He sees the wolf coming. He gets up at night, midnight, whatever it is, and goes out and protect the sheep. And once the sheep sees him, the sheep settle down. Amen. He leads them besides green, into green pastures where they can eat good and get real fat. I was reading about sheep and they say a, sh a sheep once born within a, about nine months, that sheep is fully grown, can weigh 100 pounds and ready for the slaughter, so to speak. If he's got a good shepherd. <laughs> oh Lord, let me leave that alone. I, ho Holy Ghost is taking me somewhere where I hadn't planned, so let me just stop and check myself. 
My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they know me. This scripture is the bedrock of this message. You, being a believer, can hear the voice of God. Amen. 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 It is not just for the pastor, the bishop, the pope, huh? the elder. But every sheep can hear his voice Amen. and should hear his voice. The quality of your Christian life and your Christian journey depends upon your ability to hear and discern the voice of God. As I shared last week, the greatest experiences that I've had in my Christian journey has really been when I've heard the voice of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. God has done a lot of things, healed me off of a deathbed. Amen. And all of those miraculous things that he's done. But it's nothing like hearing the voice of God. Amen. I told you I was inspired with this message when uh, I had certain friends to come by my house regularly on Saturdays and witness to me. And I had invited them to uh, have a Bible study with me. And I went and got donuts and everything, wanted them to be comfortable and fix my table for them and everything. And so just one guy came. I was a little disappointed. I thought I wanted him to bring all the brethren so we can have this Bible study. You say, well, brother, you're sure pretty bold. Well, I know in whom I believe and what I believe and in whom I put my trust Amen. and my confidence. So in the conversation with the brother and I was sharing some of my experience about how I was at Maryville College trying to decide if I was in between, in between a fork in the road in my life, All right. wanting in my flesh to go to Harvard and get an MBA. And then knowing that I've been called by God, I'm sitting in class, in a classroom, going in this direction. I can visualize it even now. I heard the voice of the Lord within my spirit say, just like I'm talking to you, this is not what I call you to do, but I've called you to teach my word. Tears begin to stream down my eyes, Paula. Tears begin to stream down my eyes. Tears begin to stream down my eyes. When you hear the voice of God, it changes you, changes your direction, changes your de destiny. And I haven't quit pursuing him since. I can understand God. Uh, I was laying in the bed just meditating. God's been waking me up at three in the morning. I can't get back to sleep. And so I just get up and I write, I read, I study, I meditate like pastors. Pastor teaching my message, pastor was saying earlier. And uh, the, the Lord was just downloading stuff to me so fast. Uh, he took me to uh, Mount Sinai where Moses was talking to God face to face. Now, he's up there 40 days and 40 nights. Y'all think all he got downloaded was just the Ten Commandments? <laughs> Come on, y'all. Y'all got more logical thinking than that. That man's up there 40 days and 40 nights. You think that all he learned about God was the Ten Commandments? And there's a scripture to tell you he got more than that. You got the oral law that comes out of that. You got the written law. You got the instructions. Scripture tells you that. And then later God told him to write down because initially he didn't write it down, but he later told him to write down what I've said to you. And these will be instructions for your people, for the people of God. And he showed me that. And the Bible says when Moses came off of that mountain, his face shone. And the Bible says that it was a type of glory that he was experiencing because our scripture says that the law was holy, but he couldn't make us righteous in and of itself. We couldn't keep the law through our flesh. And so it say that ministration which had its glory, 
is not to be compared to the ministration that we now have in Jesus Christ. Amen. That has a higher level of glory. Such that when you look into the word of God and you meditate, as the Bible says, as a mirror, 1 Corinthians 3, and you behold the word of God, it changes us into the very image of God, his son. That's why we can say we're going from glory to glory. Every time you sit down and open your Bible and ask God to download to you, he's taking you from glory to glory. That glory that Adam lost in the garden, he's restoring in you. That image that was in Adam, he's renewing it in you. Every time you sit down and behold the word of God, that image of Jesus Christ in you is being perfected. You got to know it. You got to know it. So that when you feel, don't feel like studying. When you don't feel like meditating. Hallelujah. When you don't feel like it. When you don't want to get up in the morning and do it. But then the voice of the Lord said, I want to meet you there. Hallelujah. He says, I want to meet you there. I hear a pastor talked about uh, in, in the heart of his ministry where he would get up early in the morning. I don't know what it is, pastor, about morning, but I've come to learn too. It's something about the quietness of the morning. Glory to God. I don't know if the devil is asleep or what's going on spiritually, but I do know something. I can hear his voice so plain. Early in the morning. Well, let me slow it down just a little bit. As the old preachers used to say, I feel my helper. <laughs> Glory to God. Um, we can hear his voice. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 1. <clears throat> really, the way that I teach... I'm really uh, more prone to, uh, in the old days, they used to say Sunday school teacher, uh, life groups and things like that. I'm more prone to that because I like to take people scripture by scripture. And it takes time to do it. And this is a topic, probably one of the most critical topics that I've ever taught. One of the most critical topics that you'll ever hear hearing the voice of God. In the book of Hebrews chapter 1, are you there? Yes. Say amen. amen. Yeah, let me find it. Right. Here we go. This is how it reads. We'll begin at verse 1. And for the listener on the internet. God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Whom he has appointed heir of all things. Through whom also he made the worlds. Now normally when people read that uh, portion of the scripture in the book of Hebrew. Just read through that real fast. And get on to what they call the nuggets down further. But I'm telling you verse 1 and verse 2 is so essential. God has spoken in times past to the people of God and he says by the prophets and I can give you scripture after scripture I, I was going to do that today but I think I'm not going to do that today because uh, I, I need to get somewhere <clears throat> it began with Adam in the garden Adam initially was a light being spiritual being without flesh. I won't go into that because I'll be get stuck there. I'll let uh, Sister Johnson handle it. Uh, he was a light being 
and um, without flesh. But when he fell, God closed him with flesh. That's a part of the glory that was lost. Amen. Chapter one is where he was a uh, chapter one of Genesis is where he raised was a light being. Chapter two is where he fell sin and sin brought us to a lower level of living. Mm -hmm. God closed him with skin. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. And put him out the garden. But before and after sinning, he still could have communications with God. Amen. Huh? Amen. Even in the book of Genesis, when you get over to uh, chapter six, the Bible says the earth had gotten so wicked and men's heart were forever evil and darkened. Yet, God was still able to communicate with man. <laughs> Y'all hear what I said? Yes, God was still able to communicate with man. Now, the quality of that communication was not like it was when he was communing with Adam and Eve. But we still have the ability, the innate ability to communicate with God. Just because we were made in his image. Amen. And although man fell, the image was only degraded. It was not destroyed. Amen. Amen. That's, why, that's why God, even after the flood, says you should not kill another man. Amen. Because the image of God is in him. Amen. Oh yeah. It tells you something about how God sees you. And how he sees the unbeliever. He says, you shouldn't kill another man. I was after the flood. He says, because my image is in him. The faculties are in him. Oh, I, I, I really didn't get into that image thing. I'm just going to hit it just briefly. One minute. When we were made in the image of God, we first were spiritual beings, and we are spiritual beings. In the book of James, it says the body without the spirit is what? Yeah. So let me say it again. The body without the spirit is what? Yeah. Brother, if the spirit leaves you right now, three of us have to pick you out of here. When you go to a funeral and someone is laying up there look like they sleep, that's because the spirit that gives life, which comes from God, has left. Yes. Hmm? The Bible says the spirit of man belongs to God. It is the candle of the Lord. Your spirit is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of your being. Amen. That's why God is able to talk to you. Amen. When you get born again, his spirit comes to dwell in your spirit. When you get born again, his spirit is able to communicate with your spirit. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But the question is, can you hear? All right. Say that. I'm saying it, brother. All right. <laughs> question is, can you hear? My sheep know my voice hmm? are y'all with me y'all still with me right I didn't finish what God revealed to me let me go back uh, uh, my motor's running 100 miles an hour gotta slow it down so I'm laying up there about 3 in the morning I'm doing some word study and I run across this word called we are being transformed into the image of the Lord. And I said, well, let me do some reach on that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, so it took me all throughout the Bible where it talks about that. And be transformed means to be changed into another form. Mm -hmm. Like a caterpillar changes into another form. Uh -huh. Butterflies change from another form. A grain of wheat when it's put into the ground is a grain of wheat. But when it comes up, it has another form. Mm -hmm. When Jesus come and resurrect your body, you're going to have another form. Yes, Call it heavenly yeah. body. <laughs> so it goes in the ground, a kernel, but when it comes up, it has another form. 
When you go into the ground, back to the dust, your spirit and your soul is still alive. But he's going to give you another body, a glorious body, like unto his glorious body, another form. Amen. And so he took me where he was talking to Moses. And we know that Moses was transformed by the glory of God and being face to face with God. Then he took me and took me over to the, where the word is used uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration. And it's the same Greek and Hebrew words meaning metamorpho, meaning to change another form. Moses and Elijah appeared to the Lord on the Mount of Transfiguration and had a conversation with him. And even before I could hardly think it, I said, well, Lord, what were they talking about? He said, well, go over here to the other gospel, synoptic gospel. He said, go over here, and, and, and that was the answer right there. He said they were talking to Jesus about his soon demise in Jerusalem where he would be crucified. Jesus needed a word from God to go to the cross for you. Jesus, the Son of God, you, 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 we, we, we elevate him so that we don't forget that he was 100% man. And he struggled with the idea of being separated from his father because of our sins. And you say, how do I know that's true, brother? Because when he went to the garden, he prayed so that it was like drops of blood from him. And then he had to finally, by the help of the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the helper, say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Yes. He was a man like you. That's why he's touched with the feelings of your infirmity. He hurts when you hurt. He feels your sickness and your sadness and your sorrows. But he's the good shepherd now. And he knows how to take care of the sheep. He's the good shepherd now. And he knows how to take care of the sheep. I remember when I was laying in that intensive care room, couldn't talk for myself, couldn't breathe for myself. And I, God brought this back to me. I woke up one morning and I, I, you know, now if I learn more about scripture, I really began, God gave me a vision. There was a man standing at my bedside like this. My bed was running like this. There was windows bright like that on that side. My bed was like this. I had a machine that was breathing for me. I couldn't talk because I used an etch -a sketch to talk to my, my parents. And uh, this guy was standing there he was clothed in all white. And he had like a, looked like he had a book. He never looked at me. He like had a book. He never looked at me. He was all white. And I don't know what it did to me, but I knew that a whole city was praying for me and my sister, because my sister went through the windshield. She was in another room in intensive care. And, uh, uh, and not long after is when they told me they were going to have to do exploratory surgery. And I later found out they didn't want to scare me. I, blood clots was forming in my lungs. And I had enough sense. I had enough sense. Wasn't a nickel's worth of nothing. But I had enough sense. With the word that was sown in me from years before. See, your kids may not be acting right. Drag them in here anyway. Amen. Get some word in them. Amen. They'll need it down the road. Amen. You hear what I said, Brother Ivy? Drag them in here anyway. Because they'll hear a word that can save their life. I had been around uh, Pentecostal folks all my life, heard them dance, seen them dance, you know. Little mother, 90 years old, dancing in an old wooden church and the floorboard singing, brother. 
Y'all know what I'm talking about. Yes. And I said, what makes that woman jump like that? 90 some years old, Lord have mercy. I didn't understand it. But the joy of the Lord. And uh, um, I, uh, I said to myself, now I know God is a healer. And I pushed past my mind saying he won't heal you because you're a sinner. My mind pushed on past that. And it was what pastor said today, he loves you despite. Yes. See, if I, had, if I didn't know that, my mind would have talked me out of talking to God. Did you hear what I said? If I didn't know that, my mind would have talked me out of talking to God. Because this is the nature of it. Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they were afraid and tried to hide from God. And that nature is still in you. If you don't know that he loves you, your nature is to pull away from God. Uh, I was telling somebody the other day, I was just teasing them. I was saying, now you were driving down the highway. And I said, are you speeding? They say, yeah, I am. I said, that makes you a lawbreaker. <laughs> they they, they, they kind of look at me. But I, I'm trying to make home a point. Yes. We have to be sensitive to every word of God. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Ain't no use you blaming God. Amen. Let the po-po pull you over. <laughs> and Medea say, let the po-po pull you over and give you a ticket. Amen. A ticket, big ticket. Hundred dollar ticket. Huh? Any issue crying about it? Use a lawbreaker. That's right, that's right. And that person, that person stopped me in the middle of talking to him and said, let me repent. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how we ought to be. But that's how we ought to be. Quick to repent. Quick to keep the enemy from separating us from God. Quick to keep our flesh from talking us out approaching to God. <laughs> yeah, I say, I say, I say I'm a probably gonna preach this. So I'm gonna have to tell him I, I preached this about you. I, won't, I didn't give him your name. <laughs> it heard up and got off that accelerator. Praise the Lord. But back to the mountain. So on Mount Transfiguration, these two guys, Moses and Elijah, was talking to Jesus, telling him about his demise coming in Jerusalem, giving Jesus. A word from the Father. Mm -hmm. Jesus needed a word from the Lord. Amen. From the Father. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says in the midst of that, he says his face began to shine like the sun. Yes. Mm -hmm. The Bible says his raiment began, Mother Carter, mm -hmm. to glisten like snow. Whiter than tide can get your clothes. Because <laughs> it says full of soap. I mean, that's what it says. It says whiter than tide can get you. I, I say tide because that's a Procter and Gamble. Y'all buy Procter and Gamble, so my spot can go up. <laughs> tide can get, you, can, can, can get your clothes white. And uh, the Bible says that the Peter, James, and John, they witnessed this. And Jesus said, don't tell nobody until after the resurrection. Hmm? You wonder why men like John and Peter and James were so prominent amongst the apostles in the church. I guess if you would have seen Jesus glow like that and somebody told you you were going to be crucified upside down, and it doesn't bother you. Oh boy. Oh boy. If God, if you'd have seen something like that, brothers, Simmons, and other miracles, and somebody in Jesus would later tell you you're gonna die premature death for him, and it don't phase you. That's why I say when you get a word from the Lord, it changes you. It'll make you like Pastor Lee, sunny, sunny, sunny California. 
and come to cold, freezing weather on his first day preaching. <laughs> below multi, below zero. When you hear a word from the Lord. Amen. <laughs> then the Lord uh, showed me this. He said, uh, now, your Bible foundation is in the Old Testament with these Jewish people who God calls his precious people, peculiar people, his prized possession. And it's not so much that they did anything worthy, but the Bible says God searched the earth for someone to get his word into the earth and it was the Jews who said, yes, we will. <laughs> the Jewish people were the ones who said, yes, I will. And so God started working through the Jewish people. Now, you wonder why they treasure the word so much that we should treasure so much. Where their rabbis study it for a lifetime, 18 hours a day. I guess if you, like them in that day, would have been around that mountain and seen God descend in the cloud. And when he came upon the cloud, the mountain shook. Smoke ascended up. And then they literally heard the voice of God audibly. And it scared them. And they say, Moses, 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 don't let God talk to you. You talk to God. We don't want to talk to God. We'll do whatever he said. How is it that a people can this many years later still feel that strongly? I guess if you had had that experience and you passed it down to your children and your children and your children in honoring the Passover and all the other festivals, I'm sorry, dear, all the other festivals, you wouldn't forget a thousand years later. That's why I tell my kids my story about how God healed me Amen. and raised me up off a deathbed. Amen. That they'll rehearse it in their ears. That's why I tell them about their grandmother who coming out of the Azusa Street Revival and it was having what they call brush over revivals under tents out in the field. And they went and visited my grandmother and my grandfather. Neither one of them was living a nickel work or nothing. And my grandmother was sick with a disease like pellagra. And when they went there and they shared the gospel, oh. she received Jesus and got healed instantly. Oh. Amen. Oh. <laughs> and she never looked back. Up until her passing in 92, she was the, the matriarch of our family, particularly spiritually. Who in your family is like that? Is that you? Where you can tell your children of what God has done in your life. Yes, yes, how God has brought you through. Hallelujah. Is that you? Yes, sir. It is. Yes. Yes. Sure it is. I'm doing on time. All right, we're doing okay. Praise the Lord. That's what God showed me the other night. Thank you. By the word. We have a sure word of prophecy. We don't have to be moved by signs. I don't need necessarily a sign to believe in God. I don't need necessarily need a wonder. I don't necessarily need a prophet or a palm reader. All I need is a word from the Lord. Yes. Oh, me. I'm on page one and a half <laughs> of 13. God yearns to speak to you. The life is in the word. We have this bread up here to illustrate it. In the Old Testament, God, to demonstrate his love for his people, despite their murmuring, wishing they was back in Egypt. 
and you've been there. You know, maybe now that you mature more, you don't wish you was back in Egypt, but in the early days, you say, why did I get saved? Huh? Yeah, yeah, all of us probably were tempted with temptation to go back. Huh? Go back to Egypt. Man, I was eating good back there, living good, partying good, good, and everything else good back there. And especially if you get in a dead church. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, uh, and despite their murmuring, God, what he did was sent them quail, quail, quail in the evening. Must have been better than fish, Brother Herman. He didn't send them fish. He didn't rain down fish. He rained down quail. You need to change the sport. <laughs> quail. And then he would rain down manna, and manna means what is it? It was manna that he would rain down, and he did it for 40 years. He did it for 40 years just to prove he's God. And he's the shepherd. And he'll take care of you. The Bible says they feet out there in that desert didn't even swell them 40 years. I don't know how you did it, God, but you said them folk were wearing them same clothes for 40 years. They didn't wear out, my Bible says. I'm talking about your shepherd. David understood it being a shepherd boy. The Lord is my shepherd. We always used to hear it in funerals, but I'm bringing you out to funeral home. I'm bringing you to your house. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down. See, when sheep gets restless, if they're hungry, if they have fear, if they have contention amongst them, y'all know how y'all are, contention amongst them, you get hungry and all that stuff, and they say they get restless and they don't want to lie down, they'll stand up on their feet. And over a course of time, it would hurt the sheep in terms of their productivity. That's why he says, he causes me to lie down in green pastures. What does that mean? He quells your fears. He provides a green pasture for you to eat where you can just lay down and munch all day. Gurgitate, munch, and gurgitate, munch, and gurgitate. He runs off every wolf. Even a rabbit will spook him. Uh, Sometimes I've, I've talked to Ella Johnson. I've used this analogy. I say, Ella Johnson, we're dealing with sheep. I say, sheep like to be beside still water. If you got crazy stuff going on, it spooks the sheep. A good shepherd knows when the sheep are diseased with flies and stuff. You know, they, they, they'll run into a wall and do crazy stuff. Uh, when they're attacked like that, pests and stuff like that. But a good shepherd knows just what medicine to give to every sheep. And he gets up every day and he expects every sheep. Now, you being a sheep, are you meeting him there? <laughs> oh, y'all ain't saying nothing. Brother, give me an amen again. You're the only one talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a good back to say amen. Hallelujah. Okay, I got to get to this before we, I'm running out of time. I'm going to say it and then we can go there. Turn with me to John chapter um, Shut up. I'm trying, brother. I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying. John chapter 14, you there? Okay, John chapter 14, <clears throat> we're gonna read it quickly here. John chapter 14, mm -hmm. verse, um, mm -hmm. 
verse. We'll start at verse 15. You there? Yeah. Let's read it. If you love me, keep my commandments. A part of hearing from God is that you're willing to obey and to keep his word. Mm -hmm. See, God knows your heart. Yeah. And if you're just shucking and jiving. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, you're if you're just shucking and jiving. Hmm? Mm -hmm. I remember, and I don't mean this in a negative way, and I never would, peradventure my daughter, see this. Uh, I'd never, I would, uh, uh, I, I had to put it in the right light. When my granddaughter was ill with cancer, and she eventually passed, and um, I know my grandkids, I mean, just, you know, not really being that, what I call really seriously solid rooted in the church, mm -hmm. uh, but that, that shook them. And so they started going to church on a regular basis. Uh, one daughter got involved in intercessory prayer and all that stuff, right? Not stuff, but um, in all those activities. <clears throat> Went to their pastor, Shalom Church, and asked him, well, why does this happen? And why is it, hasn't God healed? And all he could say is, I don't know why. And then my, my granddaughter eventually passed. She was saved and everything. We had prepared her. I had a whole year to work with her and everything. So she, you know, I know that, you know, she, she never suffered or nothing like that, right? Mm -hmm. And so, Later on down, a year, two, three years later, I noticed my grandkids not even going to church. And ever since then, I've still encouraged them about the Lord, live before them, not beating up on them, anything like that, but just living the life. And I know that they're nibbling at the word and this and that other, but I want to see them in the church active. Amen. Do you think God didn't know that's what they would do? Did you, do you think God did not foresee what their promise, whether or not they would keep their promises? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, let's read. Okay. Verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments mm -hmm. and I will pray the father and he will give you another helper mm -hmm. that he may abide with you for how long? Is that helper's going to abide with you how long? Amen. It's like he's better than Alexa. Amen. Or Siri. Amen. He's better than your Alexa on your phone. Your Siri. He'll abide with you forever. Amen. He said, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in what? Be where? In you. The help was in you. Amen. Okay, let's look. Let's go on now. All right. Okay. The spirit of truth, who the world, we read that. Now, let's do this. We know we got a helper, right? right. He's in us, right? Yes. Let's go to verse six, uh, chapter 16. Verse 16. Verse. Okay. Chapter 16, you have it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Let us read. Verse, starting in verse 5. But now I go away to him, I go away to him who sent me. Jesus talking about going back to the Father. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things, sorrow has filled your heart. So they be, Jesus began to inform them around what his mission was, that he was going to the cross. Eventually he began to do that because really for a long time they didn't understand nothing about the resurrection or any of that. They were blind to it. And it says, uh, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is your advantage that I go away. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, brother Vernon. Stop. <laughs> Paula, it's to your advantage that he went away. Yes. Brother Herman, it's to your advantage that he went away. Amen. Jesus, the miracle worker? Lay hands on sick folk, mm -hmm. heal the blind, raise the dead. It's better that you go away. How can it get any better than that? Why don't you, you know, you have eternal life. Why don't you just stay here with us? Let's read on. All right. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is your advantage that I go away. 
For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. In other words, the helper must bring some kind of something, something, something. Bring some kind of something, something, something that's better than what Jesus could provide. <laughs> Let's go. He said, verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth, come, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me. He will take on what is mine and declare it to you. For the interest of time, let me just do a little paraphrase. He's in mother. He's in Sister Myrtle. He's in Elder Johnson. All right. He's in you. He's there to give you a word from the Lord. Yes. Your helper. Mm -hmm. You know something? Now, helpers come for a high dollar, just depending on what they're providing. But this helper, you didn't pay for. Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's available to you. I'm going to say this and then we're, I'm going to switch gears. I'm, uh, I'll come back next week and re, re, revisit, right? Jesus said he will receive a mind and show it to you. He will receive a mind and show it to you. In Hebrews chapter one, it says God has spoken to us in the last days, which last days is since Jesus raised from the dead. We're in the last days. Jesus speaks his mind to the Holy Spirit and he reveals it to you. Amen. That's what he's saying. Amen. That's why Jesus said it's better that I go away. Because, mm -hmm. brother, I can minister to you. Yes. Jesus, I can minister to you, Amen. to you. To you, I will take of mine and show it to you. And I love the terminology that he used. Your conscience was purified by the blood of Jesus. And when the Holy Spirit in you is working on you, sanctifying you, if you let him, he's sanctifying your conscience as well. Your conscience can be your guide if it's being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Your conscience is the voice of your soul. Not the voice of the Holy Spirit, but it is the voice of your soul. Amen. And you can be led and guided by your soul. Some of you learned a long time ago, thou shalt not kill. And if, even though before you got saved, you know there was something wrong about killing. Yeah. You knew when you went to the candy store and you stuck that piece of candy in your pocket, like I did, that conscience said that ain't right. Well, where did that come from? Because you had heard it in church or mama or somebody and your conscience, though degraded, still was guiding you. Amen. But now that the Holy Ghost has come. Oh, right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, and he's informing your conscience by the word. Guiding you. The Bible says those who are mature in the Lord it says, have their senses exercised to know good from evil. Amen. I don't even need a word from the Lord. Their conscience are exercised and they can trust their conscience in their guiding to fulfill the will of God yes. to a certain degree. Yes. Paul, I can give you many scriptures in the book of Acts where Paul did that. He said, I perceived by the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Your conscience can be your guide. If you'll submit it to the word of God. Amen. 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 <laughs> um, Elder Johnson, come up. I, I, uh, um, let me do this, Elder Johnson, you get your thoughts together. Um, 
this idea, the way that God worked with Jesus when he was on the earth, he would go up and he would pray. Early morning, late at night, get away from the crowd. And God would speak to him, share his thoughts to Jesus. He would reveal things to him about what was going to happen the next day. And he would do them. He says, I do what I see my father do. Yeah. <laughs> this morning when I got up, God said, I I'm going to demonstrate to you. It's just you. I, I was laying on my sofa about Friday. Spirit of the Lord said, Sister Paula is putting together a trip to Branson. Why don't you bless somebody? Amen. And uh, I, I, uh, I said, that, well, I don't know who, who, who needs a blessing. I said, I really would like to do it. So I was willing. When I heard the voice, I obeyed. I said, I'm willing. So I said, maybe I'll just approach Sister Paula and say, Paula, do you know somebody want to go on that trip? And I'll just pay that price for them. This morning when I got up and I was shaving, the Lord said, it's Paula. Glory to God. I saw you. God showed me you. It could have gone to somebody else. But God said, no, it's Paula. Amen. He'll show you things. Yes. 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 I said, well, why her, Lord? Mm -hmm. Because her gift in ministering to the saints mm -hmm. at a time like this. Yes. Amen. <sighs> her Amen. gift. Amen. Faithful in her gift Amen. to minister to the saints. To put up with you sheep. <laughs> Faithful. Yes. Just like he did with those handmaidens back in Egypt who defied Pharaoh and saved the Hebrew babies. Yes, sir. And the Bible said the Lord provided houses for them. Yes. So you see me afterwards. Yes, now you weren't here last Sunday, but if you'd have missed this Sunday, God said, you won. That's why I tell y'all, don't, don't ever miss church. I'll be in around the world, but God may have something for you. Amen. Elder Johnson, go for it. I need a mic, guys. Here it is, Elder. Okay, thank you. I already prepared. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we're going to try to get down as quickly as we can, but Elder Lewis asked me a couple weeks ago, if I would give a testimony about hearing from God. Now, this message is about not so much about prayer, you talking to God, but you hearing from God. Amen. It's quite important to us. Now, how many know what a father is? What is a father? Who has a definition? Who can tell me what a father is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. He's a source. Mm -hmm. A father is the source or the origin or the beginning of something. Mm -hmm. It could be a person, it could be a river, it could be an island, but a father has the responsibility of number one, beginning. That means he's the source of something. He's the origin of it. Amen. He doesn't start without the Father. He is the begetter. But what he begets, he also has the responsibility of sustaining. Say sustaining. Sustaining. Anyone who, for, who begets and doesn't sustain it is not a father. Right. Now if it's human, he's merely a sperm donor. So don't just say a boy who gets a girl pregnant. And the kids call him father if he done jumped the fence and gone with Shadita instead of being at home with the baby that he had. <laughs> a father sustains what he begat. Yes. It has always been God's desire to sustain who we are, the begotten. Amen. God. Amen. Always. From the very beginning, Elder Lewis alluded to that in the garden. He has always wanted to sustain what he has begotten. Turn your Bible to Ephesians chapter 2 very quickly. Amen. Ephesians 2. We want to start reading at verse 14. 
Ephesians 2, verse 14. For he, greeting Jesus, is our peace, very one and the same, who had made both one and had broken down the middle wall of petition between us. Made both one means the Jews or the Gentiles and us. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in order, this is talking about the Ten Commandments, for to make in himself a plain or two, one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God, and how many bodies? One, one body. body. How? By the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, in verse 17, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were not. Now verse 18, for through him we we both have access by how many spirits? One spirit. spirit. Now, the Lord's been teaching us about that one spirit. By unto the Father. The Holy Spirit connects us to the Father and the Son. Yes. What the Son says, you hear via the Holy Spirit. Yes. What the Father says, you hear via the Holy Spirit. Yes. Now, God is still seeking to sustain what he has begotten in you, the new birth preacher, by himself through the Holy Spirit. Amen. What a good father begets, he sustains, he upholds, he keeps going. Yes. A good father will always be there for his children. Yes. Amen. Now the bottom line, I know many of you know fathers who don't know what we're talking about today, but the bottom line is that when you have a father caring that much about us from the very beginning in the garden, you wanted to talk to his man, he did so, cool of the day, you know that from the scripture. But now, even so, he wants to talk to you. Yes. We're talking about you being available to hear the voice of God and then doing something about it. Yes. If you hear and you don't do, what good is that? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Yeah. Only a doer of the word gets what? Blessed. Gets blessed. Only a doer of the word gets blessed. Jesus had to do what his father wanted him to do. We have to do what we, uh, our father wants us to do. Give me an example of being led by the Holy Spirit. In all my years of being a Christian, I got born again somewhere in the early 80s. I don't remember the uh, exact year, but it was in the early 80s, around 81, 82. My very first experience of being led by the Holy Spirit was through a word of knowledge from my wife. Women always seem to be more spiritual than we are, guys. <laughs> they seem to be more open to God, to hear the voice of God, to do spiritual things, to perform spiritual things. But anyway, I'm on my bed getting ready to go to work that day. She came over to me and she said, Thus says the Lord. You will be promoted to position or principal, but you will not immediately accept that principalship. But he said, but this I am giving you, because we're trying to be faithful in our giving, operating with the poor and whatnot, helping people out and whatnot. And that was his way of blessing my household. Uh -huh. And I said, oh no, I don't want any parts of that principalship because I've been an assistant principal for a couple of years and I knew how bad that job was. <laughs> I said, no, I don't want to be number one. So get somebody else to do that. But that word of knowledge from the Holy Spirit, I finally acted upon it. Now only when you act upon what you hear can God truly bless you. Amen, brother. Now he can want to bless you, but if you draw back, and he says, my soul has no pleasure in a drawback spirit. If you draw back and don't follow through on what he's saying to you, then you won't get blessed. Simple as that. So I thought about it, went down for the interview. They didn't call me after I got through interview. Come to find out somebody else got the position that was available. But God, in his faithfulness to his word, now he had already told her that he wanted to move in this position. So I said, well, okay, I'll accept it. 
The person who got the position, he left the position after only two or three days being in it. I guess it was too rough for him or whatever. But anyway, he left the position. So they called me and said, do you want, I said, yeah, I guess I'll have to take it. <laughs> but that was the first time I got a word from the Lord. I was led by a word of knowledge. Now the difference between a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom is that when God gives you a word of wisdom, he gives you knowledge, but he gives you a way to get done what he wants you to do. Right. That's the wisdom. So the wisdom wasn't a word of wisdom, it was a word of knowledge. Next incident whereby God was leading us, we had an opportunity to invest in um, a, a company. And I put company in quotation marks. A company via a telephone call. Again, this is back in the 80s. Exact year, don't remember. But anyway, this guy called us and told us that there was an investment opportunity whereby if we would come up with, what was it, $15,000? $15,000, we could invest this in a certain portfolio, and there would be a guaranteed return after an X number of days on that. And he made it so smooth, it sounded so good, we said, yeah, 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 this is what we want. We Sometimes the Holy Spirit will just tell you not to do something. Sometimes it won't be an audible word, but you just can't pull the trigger on it. A check in your spirit. A check in your spirit. Mm -hmm. So, after a few days, the guy called back and said, did you send the check? And I said, no, I haven't sent the check yet because something just isn't right about this. He was persistent in calling, encouraging, lying about what this talk would do. He called us almost on a daily basis. I will send somebody by your house to pick up the check. You don't even have to put it in the mail. Now, was that convenient or was that convenient? <laughs> But it was a scam, say scam. Scam. The check in our spirit, in my spirit, I don't know what was going on with the woman, <laughs> but the check in my spirit said, I can't write out a check for $15,000 for something I know nothing about. So I did more research on it, come to find out it was a scam. God put a check in my spirit. Sometimes he will check your spirit. About you want to do something, and you say, mm, maybe I just don't want to do that. Maybe I just don't want to do that. Another incident whereby I had the experience of being led by God's Spirit happened when <clears throat> I was in St. Louis and my dad and I had been separated ever since I was five years old. He was a man of not a whole lot of understanding because he was bold enough to bring his girlfriend to our house when we were living when I was a child in Arkansas. He was ready to make a move with this lady to marry her, in other words. He brought her to our house. Now my mother, as perceptive as she was, knew something was amiss between her and the woman. There was a big brew hall in my house that day. In other words, there was a fight between these two ladies, my mom and the girlfriend. But can you imagine the audacity of my daddy to bring his girlfriend to our house? <laughs> For that reason, that sparked unforgiveness in me. I never forgave him for that. If you don't forgive others, will God forgive you your trespasses? No. I didn't know that. I was a heathen at the time. A heathen. All the years since the time I was five years old up until about the time I guess I was 30 something in the 80s and whatnot, I had this intense dislike and intense hatred for my dad. But there was an unction from the Holy One. I'm a heathen. I wasn't born again. I knew nothing about being born again. All I knew was that my daddy did my mama wrong and I would never forgive him. So I was a heathen, but there was a desire, a desire, he will give you a desire to do something, that I had to go and reconcile with my raggedy day. <laughs> it's as simple as that. I got in my car one day, my wife said, where are you going? I'm going to Detroit. Or what are you going to do in Detroit? I'm going to reconcile with my dad. 
When I saw my dad in that nursing home, he immediately recognized me. I came up to him, I said, you don't know who I am, do you? Hadn't seen the man in over 20 years. He said, yeah, you tagged. Tad was short for Tad Cole. That was my kitty name. <laughs> Tad Cole. And don't you dare agree with me. Hey, Pastor Tad. <laughs> but anyway, when he saw me, he said, yes, you're Tad. I had a chance to talk to him, put all that forgiveness out of my life, and, and there was a peace. Over Again, I had done what God wanted me to do. Amen. Another incident that ties in with this. My wife and I had been a part of a, for our former church, and we would from time to time you know, entertain some of the saints at our house. We had started a Bible study in uh, the community, and we would go to that Bible study, study religiously every, what was it, on Thursdays? Do you remember? Okay, she doesn't remember, but anyway, that's all right. But anyway, we would go to a village and every week we were leading the Bible study. Of course, the people expected us to be there. And one day when I was at this Bible study, the Holy Spirit just prompted me to speak out in the open air among the people, speaking to the female hostess of the Bible study. Now, this is in their house. And the Holy Spirit said to me, to this lady, you have a root of bitterness in you. Now, I didn't know anything about her except that she was a gracious hostess, except they always opened their home to have this Bible study, but he was trying to get to her through me. Just an open word to her. Now, she didn't say anything about it, but I think she got offended, and for that reason, she would always have some reason not to associate with us when it came to having another dinner or whatever. I used to fix something called chicken a la orange, orange chicken, which was a out of sight dish. If you never <laughs> had that, it was just as close to orange duck. We fixed it for her, we would call her, she'd come over and eat. But she got to the point whereby she had a root of bitterness in her that transferred to us. She had something against us. She would not tell us what it was. Root of business, moving forward very quickly. The lady got sick and she had to be hospitalized. She and her husband got separated. She went to live in one place and he stayed in the apartment. But when she got sick, we went to the hospital to visit somebody else and we found out she was there at the same time. So I said, come on, let's go and see her. We went in to see her. Now here's how the Holy Spirit worked. That bitterness root in her coupled with unforgiveness toward us. When she saw us, she immediately broke down and went to crying, uncontrollably crying. Could not stop crying. The Holy Spirit working in her. Uh -huh. So, him leading us to her so that she could get that out of her and get the unforgiveness out, the lady died a few days after that. Happened another time, another person, root of unforgiveness in her. We bought some rental properties. She felt as though she should have been the listing agent. She was a friend of ours. We couldn't go through her because it was bank foreclosure property. They said, we don't want any realtors involved in this whatsoever. So we told her that. But after we bought the property, that root of bitterness and unforgiveness came up again in her. And again, the lady got sick. This sounds like a duplication or something. She got sick and had to be hospitalized. What did she need, a kidney? Okay, she needed a, a liver transplant? Okay, got a liver transplant, but she lost consciousness and was unconscious for several days. Holy Spirit prompted me one day to say, come on, let's go, we're going out to see her. When we got there, she was conscious. Now, she had been unconscious all this time. And guess what happened when she saw us? She started what? Crying. Holy Spirit working on her. Yeah. She died a few days after that. God doesn't want anybody, especially his children, to die in unforgiveness. I said, if you don't forgive others their trespasses, yeah. he can't forgive you your trespasses. Yeah. So this was the grace of God in leading us by his Holy Spirit to go and get things right with people before they went on to the other side. So 
God has continually flashed me that I'll uh, share with you. I've already shared it with you, but for the sake of those who weren't here, then I'll be through. Is that got a call from a former church member said to me about four months ago, this is what the Spirit of the Lord told me in my prayer time today to share with you all. He shared with me what I've already shared with you as far as the sale of the property. So I said, I'd have to take this to our board and see if there are any witnesses to that. Took it to the board. There were no witnesses. There was no one who could bear witness that this is what we're supposed to do. But God, in his faithfulness, began to uncover signs and wonders that this is me talking to you all. He showed us several signs that it was his spirit who was prompting us to do this. Because I personally I wasn't going to do it without some kind of science. Because there was no other word from any other board member or any other person and whatnot. But he corrected me on that. He said he confirmed his word by signs following, by signs and wonders, as a matter of fact. But just wanted to share with you, and this is not all that God has done in my life and whatnot, and I'm sure you could give a similar testimony. But I just want to share that with you, that it's important for us to react once God does tell us something to do. Okay, I'll let us in. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Elder Johnson. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I wanted y'all to hear from somebody else other than me, because I give you a lot of examples all the time. And I've got a couple of more um, planned. I'll be getting with you next week. And uh, one of the areas that I, I want to cover is how can you know it's God talking to you? And not your own thoughts or some other voice. How can you confirm? Do y'all know God is okay with you asking him to confirm his word? Amen. You know, we've kind of make a big joke out of Gideon. Gideon asked the Lord three different times. Maybe the boy was hard of hearing. I don't know what his problem was. But he asked God three times to verify that you want me to go up and do this battle with that fleece. Do you know God is okay with your quotation mark fleece and make an inquiry about him? Because he don't want you to miss it. Amen. And so next week, That'll be one of the areas that we'll probe in. How do you position yourself to hear from God? And then once you hear, how do you confirm it? And we'll cover that next week. Y'all with me? Amen. Praise you, Praise you the Lord. Praise you the Lord. Praise you the Lord. For you in the audience, thank you for joining us today. And as you've heard, the Lord's sheep hear his voice. And you've heard a couple of examples today of that. But the key to really hearing God's voice clearly and having that fellowship with him as one person would be to another, you have to be born again. Amen. The Bible in the book of John chapter 3 says this. Nicodemus asked him, how can a man get into heaven? And Jesus said, no, 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 no. You, it's not about you going back into your know, mother's womb. I mean, the dude was all confused. Going back into your mother's womb and being born again. No, he says that which is born of the spirit right. is spirit. Uh -huh. And he said it is by the spirit of God that baptizes us and puts us into the body of Christ. That's what the book of Corinthians share. It is by the spirit of God that we're baptized into Christ. And then we have the spirit of Christ in us that leads us and guides us. So if you are here, listening here today, and uh, you have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, if you have not been placed in the body of Christ, I'm saying to you, the Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, had the experience of, by the Spirit, of going into the third heaven. Well, Y'all know it's seven heavens, right? He went to the third heaven. And the Bible says he saw things and heard things, Mother Carter, that it wasn't lawful for him to come back and share with us. We on our way to a party like you ain't never been to. It may even be a good old time fish fry. 
like you ain't never had before. We on our way with something, something, something about to happen. As we're being conformed to his image. And the Bible says in the end, we'll be as he is. When that last trumpet sound and the dead in Christ shall rise again and we'll take on a new form. We'll be like him. That's what your Bible say. In every version. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. You don't want to miss it. The Bible says everybody born into the earth, every soul born into the earth name is written in the book of life. But if you don't accept what Jesus Christ did for you, your name will be blotted out of the book. That shows the mercy of God. Before you even came here, your name was written in the book Amen. of life. But if you refuse the best thing that God had to give to us, your name will be blotted out. If God is dealing with your spirit today, I'm going to ask you to bow your head with me, touch the screen, whatever you need to do is an act of faith. The Bible says he that cometh to him, he will in no wise cast out. Even today, as you feel this tugging at your heart. It is by the Spirit of God that's drawing you. The Bible says the day that you hear his voice, and I mean today, don't harden your heart. Don't reject him. Tomorrow is not promised to you. A lot of people have walked out of church and said, well, maybe I'll do it tomorrow. I'm just not ready yet. You'll never get ready on your own. Amen. Accept the gift that God has given, Jesus Christ. He said, if you will confess him with your mouth that he is the son of God, that he died for your sins, that he was raised from the dead on the third day. And when you call upon him, you shall be saved. If you'll just say this prayer with me, Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you. You said that I would in no wise cast you out. Therefore, I know that you won't cast me out but that you will receive me. I acknowledge that I lived in sin, but by your son, my sins have been forgiven. You said if I would call upon your name, if I would believe that Jesus Christ is your son, he died for my sins, and he rose again on the third day that I might be one with you, you said I'd be saved. Father, I accept Jesus Christ into my heart. Come live in me. Show me the pathway of life. In Jesus' name I pray. And then the Lord said, you need a helper. You heard him about it today. He says, if you ask, you'll receive. If you seek him, you'll find him. And if you knock, every door will be open to you. Jesus said in that day you'll ask nothing in my name but whatsoever you ask the father in my name he'll give it to you Amen. so father, let's pray this prayer with me father, father in the name of Jesus, name of Jesus. you said if I, Spirit, if I would ask for the Holy Spirit that you would give him to me it is not by feelings but it's by faith I receive into my life this moment the Holy Spirit by faith in Jesus name and when I'm inspired of the Holy Spirit I will speak in tongues as the Spirit so leads in Jesus name the Bible said if you prayed that prayer you are a child of God the angels in heaven are rejoicing and we rejoice with you amen I encourage you to find a good Bible-believing church. You need to be surrounded by like-minded people. Iron sharpens iron. Mm -hmm. At the bottom of our screen, there's a telephone number. We will be glad to minister to you to whatever needs you may have. You call us, you have need of a Bible, literature to get you started, or recommendations on what church you, uh, may be available to you, we can share that with you. So do give us a call. Let us know what God has done in your life to the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Let's give him a hand clap.
As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. And as Sister Visors taught us, that son is we us in the Greek. And what it means is mature. Mature. People who are mature in God hear the voice of God. They are led by the Spirit of God and they do great things for God. Amen. Listen to me carefully. God, God just drilled this in me. He said, Vernon, I meant it when I said the works that I do shall you do. Amen. Because when I give you instruction by the Holy Ghost and you see them in your mind, because he'll download it into your mind, mm -hmm. just like I did with Paul. He said, you'll do great works. Yes. He said, you'll do greater works than I do. Amen. Because I go to the Father. Yes, hallelujah. Receive it Amen. in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on up, brother. Amen. With that being said, we are going to go into part of those benefits of the believer, healing and everything else that comes in communion. And so if you have your communion at home, I'm asking you to go ahead and get that prepared right now and uh, turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I will go ahead and I will get my communion and serve communion to, to my, my studio audience. <laughs> All right, so what I'm going to do, not going to spend an awful lot of time with communion, but I just want to point out a few things. Again, I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. When we think about the word communion, there's so much in that. I loved it back in the first grade, second grade, and all those years of elementary where they taught us about base words and root words. Well, communion, in that word, there's community, there's communication, there's unity, there's union. All of that's in there. Unity. And so it's all in communion. Communion is a sharing. It's a oneness. It's a togetherness. What are we sharing? We're sharing in his life, but we're sharing in his death first. We're sharing in that. We're sharing in that with Jesus. That's what communion is about. And so we got two elements. We got the cup and we have the bread. We have the blood. In other words, we have the body. And these, these things represent different things. There's a reason why there's two elements. It could have just been one, but no, there's a reason why there's two elements. And part of that is, again, if I look down at verse 29 in chapter 11, it says, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. A lot of people aren't discerning the Lord's body. Now, I've been taught a whole lot about just this scripture, but what I'm asking you to do is discern what that body means. Discern, just as what I said in, in the message is, he took everything on the body, because that's the physical instrument that he had. He took it all. He took up your sins. He stood in your place. He took it so that you don't have to take it. That's why, if I go back to verse 26, or is it 26 or maybe? Yeah. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. We want to be able to proclaim the Lord's death. Let me give you a, a, a deeper revelation. Proclaim the Lord's death. You can also say it like this. Proclaim the Lord's sacrifice. Proclaim the Lord's reconciling me back to God. Proclaim the Lord standing in my place so that I don't have to take it. Proclaim the Lord has cured diabetes. Proclaim the Lord has cured high blood pressure. Proclaiming the Lord has eradicated the effects of a stroke. All of that proclaiming his death until he comes. It is one of the most important concepts and attitudes that you can have in communion is proclaiming his death till he come. Our healing is in this. And so with that being said, verse 24, and when he had given thanks, he break it. And he said, take heed, this is my body, which is broken 
I'm going to say proper translation is given or sacrifice for you. This do in remembrance of me. And so with that being said, please partake of the body. And now the second element, the blood. Let it, before even going to that, remember these, these are tied together, but they're separate for a reason. Remember that a sacrifice has already occurred. He took that on. So at this point, when you acknowledge the Christ and him crucified, also acknowledge I'm healed with that and that act alone. That and that alone, I'm healed already before I even do anything else. But when I get the blood, see, blood represents life. If blood is taken out of the body, the life is taken out of the body. But when I get the blood back in, I got life. I got that perfect life. I got that perfect blood from that perfect sacrifice. I don't have to have it sprinkled on me anymore. I don't have to have it thrown around or gone to the mercy seat because now goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Send me, Christ in me, the hope of life. And so when I take this, I can use it as representative of I'm washed clean already because of the sacrifice that he's made. And this is that life. This is my sealing. This is his signature on the testimony of his New Testament, of his will, of my fullness, my redemption, my reconciliation back to God. So with that being said, and after that same manner, he also took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament, my will, and testimony, my signature, in my blood, this do you, as often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. So with that being said, let us take the cup. All right. Well, let me end this with a prayer. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your, your sacrifice, which was given, uh, your body, which was given for us. We thank you for healing. We thank you right now, Lord God, that I've been set free and made whole, set free from, from anything in my body that's wrong with blood. All my organs are working correctly. All of, all of my mind is working correctly. I'm healed spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally. In every way, I'm healed because of your sacrifice. And I thank you that I have life and I have a life eternal because of your blood. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've already done and all that you continue to do in a simple sacrifice that you did for us. Thank you for your love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. See you back next week.